This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nano Fabrication. I'm Chris Mack, and this is Lecture six, 6 on PN junctions. We're going to talk about how to form PN junctions and what the properties of this very important structure, the PN junction, uh, what the properties of that structure is, and uh, eventually how these PN junctions are used in making transistors. So, forming a PN junction. Uh, let's suppose we start with a wafer that's uniformly doped. We'll pick P-type as our example, but it could be uh, just as well N-type. Um, either the whole wafer is uniformly doped, or we'll consider some small region on the wafer, and within this region it's uniformly doped. We'll call that type of a region a well. So this would be a P-well or a P-type well, where within this region it's all uniformly uh, doped. Then we'll take an N-type dopant, a donor, and introduce it at the top of the wafer and let it diffuse in. We'll talk about diffusion and we'll talk about introducing dopants later on in the semester. Uh, so now we're just going to assume we know how to do that and uh, we'll let it diffuse in such that the concentration profile will look like a Gaussian. So the peak concentration will be right at the top of the wafer and then the concentration will, will go down as a Gaussian function uh, a, as a function of depth into the wafer. Let's see what that looks like on a plot. Uh, we typically plot concentrations on logarithmic scales because uh, the concentration can vary by orders of magnitude. Uh, so at the top of the wafer we see we've got this uh, uh, peak concentration and then it falls off with depth into the wafer. So this is at the top of the wafer 200, 400, 600 nanometers into the wafer. Now a Gaussian function, if we plot it on a logarithmic scale, looks like a parabola. So that's why they see the, this red curve, which is the, uh, the concentration of the donors, uh, is, is, a, is a parabolic shaped curve. Now the background, this uniformly doped wafer, has acceptors at a certain concentration, uh, uniform. So now we have both. We have both acceptors and donors. Uh, in, in this wafer after we've diffused our uh, n-type dopant. We will define the junction between the p-type region and the n-type region as the point where these two concentrations are equal. So there's a certain point here, it's about 630 nanometers or so down into the wafer where ND equals NA, the concentration of donors equals the concentration of acceptors. Well, we saw last time that given uh, dopant concentrations, we can calculate the mobile charge carrier concentrations, the number of electrons, the number of holes that are going to be in the semiconductor using the charge balance equation coupled with the mass action equation, NP equals NI squared. Well, we can take these profiles, perform those calculations, and show what the N and P profiles are going to look like. Uh, so the dotted lines here show you the dopants uh, in their original concentrations, and here we show N and P as well, the mobile charge carriers of electrons, N, and holes, P. Now, uh, when, when we're in a region, say over here, where the number of, of uh, donor dopants far exceeds the number of acceptors, see we several orders of magnitude higher, then we're going to be dominated by the majority carrier, which in this case will be electrons. Over here, where the number of acceptor dopants far exceeds the number of donor dopants, the more majority charge carrier will be holes. And as a result, P will be about equal to the concentration of the acceptors in this region, N will be about equal to the concentration of donors in this region. The interesting part occurs here near the junction. This is where uh, N is about equal to P, um, the number of donors is about equal to the number of acceptors, and we have to work out the math uh, carefully and fully without approximation to figure out what N and P are going to do. So what do you think N and P are going to do exactly at the junction? We're exactly at the junction, we've got just as many acceptors as we have donors in our dopant atoms. When they create these donate electrons or accept electrons, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to get a lot of recombination. 
and the hand is going to find a, uh, find a P, and the electron is going to find a hole, they're going to recombine and they're going to disappear. If the number of holes equals the number of electrons, we will create intrinsic material. So right here at the junction, the concentration of N and P doesn't go to zero, it goes to the intrinsic concentration level. Uh, as you might recall, at room temperature, that's about 1.5 times 10 to the 10th uh, number of, of carriers per cubic centimeter. So N will equal P will equal NI right at the junction. So that's going to be an important property of junctions. At the junction, things will look like intrinsic material. Well, this is a very, very typical PN junction, how it looks and how we form it. But before we analyze the properties of this PN junction, we're going to make a simplifying approximation. We're going to take this shape, the way it looks right here, and we're going to approximate it as a step function. This will be our idealized PN junction. On one side, we have all N at a uniform concentration. On the other side, we have all P at a uniform concentration. And at the junction, it's an abrupt step from one to the other. Now, obviously, that is not what this really is. But eh, for the purposes of our analysis, it will be a reasonable approximation. It will help us understand uh, what, what's going to happen, what the physics of a PN junction is going to be like. We'll be able to derive some simple equations for the behavior of a PN junction. And then when we need to, we can use more exact calculations and profiles in some numerical simulators, um, which is exactly what people in the industry do although we, we won't be talking about that or working any of those kinds of problems in this class. We're going to strictly stick to things like this idealized PN junction. Uh, and its main purpose is to give us a feel for the physics of a PN junction. All right, so let's take a look at the behavior of this idealized PN junction. And the way I'll think about it is I've got this big block of N-type material and this big block of P-type material, and I'm going to bring them together and see what happens. So they come together and they make contact. What's going to happen? Well, we've got a high concentration of P-type material on one side and a high concentration of N-type material. That concentration gradient will drive diffusion. So think about uh, the region on the right. Lots and lots of holes floating around. They'll begin to diffuse. And they'll diffuse across the concentration barrier, which means they'll diffuse over to the n-type material. Now, if a hole diffuses into the n-type material, what do you think is going to happen? You've got this hole completely surrounded by an excess of electrons. Well, it's going to find an electron and recombine. Likewise, you've got these electrons in the n-type region. Concentration gradient will cause diffusion of those electrons into the p-type region. But as soon as the electron reaches this region that has a, an excess of holes, it's very likely to find a hole, recombine. So that's what's going to happen. These, these charges are going to move to the other side uh, where they'll be the minority carrier. They'll find a member of the opposite sign and recombine. That means in this region surrounding the junction, our holes and electrons are going to disappear. They're going to be depleted uh, as they recombine. And we will form what is called a depletion region surrounding the junction. So you see there's this region where uh, the, the mobile charge carriers are depleted. Uh, essentially, this depletion region will have no mobile charge carriers. Um, uh, it'll look like intrinsic material within this region. But we should look a little bit more carefully. What else is in that region? The mobile car charge carriers have disappeared, but our dopants are still there. And remember, our dopants are ionized. So in the n-type region, we have all these donors that are incorporated into the crystal structure. They gave up their electrons, and so they're positively charged. They're ionized donors. And they're locked in place. They are fixed in the crystal structure. They're not moving around. 
Likewise, in the P-type region, and this is everywhere in the N-type region, right? Ionized donors everywhere. Uh, in the P-type region, everywhere there are ionized acceptors, acceptors that have accepted an electron, so they're negatively charged, creating these mobile holes. Those are everywhere, but in the bulk of the material, the positive donors are compensated electrically by the mobile electrons, and so the material is neutral. Likewise, in the bulk of the P material, you've got all these ionized acceptors, but you also have an equal number of holes, so it is a neutral material. But in the depletion region, we have depleted the material of the mobile holes and the mobile electrons. So the only thing that's left are the ionized dopants. The ionized dopants are fixed in place, and they're separated. On one side, in the n-type region, we have all the positive ionized donors. On the other side, in the p-type region, we have all the ionized acceptors that are negatively charged. That separation of charge is also called the space charge region. So we use those terms interchangeably. Depletion region, space charge region means the same thing. Uh, one describes how the mobile char charge carriers are depleted. Uh, the other name, the space charge region, shows how the fixed charge is separated in space, positive on one side, negative on the other. Now this space charge region, the ionized dopants, because they're separated spatially, we have a voltage. The positive charges are all on the n-type side. The negative charges are all on the p-type side. That separation of charge is a voltage, and we call it the built-in voltage that is across the depletion region, across the p-n junction. Now, this gives rise to another interesting phenomenon. So we talked about diffusion. Uh, we have a concentration gradient, and the holes will diffuse from the p-type side all across over to the n-type side. The electrons will diffuse from the n-type side over to the p-type side. And that diffusion is going to keep on going. Right? Just because we form this depletion region doesn't mean there isn't a concentration gradient anymore. There still is. And diffusion keeps going. And we call this diffusion of charge a diffusion current, because it is an electrical current. Uh, by the way, the convention, the sign convention that we use for current um, in electrical circuits, the way electrical engineers all, all define this, is the direction that positive charges move. So here the diffusion current will go from the p-type side to the n-type side. It's the direction that positive charge would move. If an electron is moving, it moves in the opposite direction of what we define as the current direction. That's simply an arbitrary sign choice but it is the choice that we have made and it's the choice we always use. Current in electrical circuits is always the direction the positive charges move. So the diffusion current is moving from the right to the left in this diagram. But we've got this built-in voltage. And a voltage causes a current. Ohm's law, V equals IR. For a given voltage, divide by the resistance R, and that tells you the amount of current that flows, and it flows from the positive voltage to the negative voltage. So you can imagine uh, an electron um, uh, being somewhere in this depletion region. What is it going to do? It's going to be pushed away from the ionized acceptors because they're negatively charged. And it's going to be pushed towards the ionized donors because they're positively charged. Likewise, if you put a hole somewhere in this depletion region, what's that charge going to do? It's going to push the hole towards uh, the, the ionized acceptors, which are negatively charged, and away from the ionized donors. So the built-in voltage creates a drift current. And this drift current is in the opposite direction from the diffusion current. Well, what, what does that mean? Diffusion is going to keep going. And as diffusion goes, more recombination occurs, the uh, depletion width will get wider the built-in voltage will grow. But as the built-in voltage grows, the drift current grows with it because the drift current is directly proportional to the built-in voltage. Eventually, you'll reach a steady state where the diffusion current equals the drift current. There's still a concentration gradient. There's still diffusion going on. But there's also a built-in voltage, and it, it causes a steady drift current to occur 
when these two currents are equal, we're in a stable state. We have a particular depletion width and a particular built-in voltage across the junction. Well, we can figure out what those things are, because we can write down equations for drift current. That's simply Ohm's law of E equals IR. Uh, diffusion current, also easy to write down. That's Fick's first law of diffusion. will tell us uh, what the diffusion current is, given the concentration gradients. Uh, so we can write down these equations, and we can set them equal to each other. And then we can solve for some unknowns. We can solve for the built-in voltage. We can solve for the depletion width. We're not going to go through any of those derivations. I'm going to simply show you the results. So here's the result for the built-in voltage across the PN junction, across the depletion region that surrounds the PN junction. This voltage, uh, I'll call it V0, and it's proportional, first of all, to something called KT over Q. K is Boltzmann's constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin, the absolute temperature, and Q is the charge on an electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. Well, uh, we can look up Boltzmann's constant in the table, the appendix in the book, etc. For a given temperature T, we can calculate what KT over Q is. For 300 degrees K, 300 Kelvin, which is about room temperature, KT over Q is 25 millivolts. So that's a good thing to remember so you don't have to bother uh, performing that calculation every time you want to look at um, uh, what KT over Q might be at, at room temperature, simply plug in 25 millivolts. So this is 25 millivolts here. And then we take the natural log of, of this. What is this? This is the acceptor concentration on the P side. This is the donor concentration on the N side. And this is the intrinsic concentration squared. So whenever the concentration of acceptors, and the concentration of donors is higher than the intrinsic concentration, we will get a built-in voltage. Now we can plug in some, some common numbers. We use doping concentrations in the you know, 10 to the 17th to 10 to the 20th um, per cubic centimeter, kind of typical ranges. At room temperature, that means this built-in voltage is going to be on the order of 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts, that kind of thing. You know, maybe as high as 0 0.9, maybe as low as 0 0.6, but a rule of just kind of an order of magnitude, the built-in voltage, voltage is a few tenths of a volt, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts. The width of the depletion region. We can also work through the various uh, mathematics to determine what the width is, and uh, I'll just give you the answer. And here it is. Uh, the width is the square root of this term, and we see it's a function of this um, uh, built-in voltage, V0. Uh, it's got the dielectric constant of silicon. That's also a, just a material parameter uh, for silicon. We can look it up. The dielectric constant of silicon is about 11.7 times mm, the dielectric constant of vacuum, uh, E0. And E0 is just one of these constants you look up in a book, and, and here it is. Uh, so we, we, we know what the dielectric constant of silicon is. Q, of course, is the charge on electron. And then here are the doping concentrations. Well, the doping concentration is built in here, but into the built-in voltage. Sorry, the, pardon the pun. But you know this goes as the log of those concentrations. So you got to change the concentration a lot before uh, the built-in voltage changes just a little. But the bigger effect on W is going to be here, where uh, the, the depletion region width is going to go as 1 over the square root of the doping concentration. So I make the uh, doping concentration higher, uh, the width gets smaller. It, you don't have to deplete as much um, uh, spatial region when the doping is really, really high. So, we now uh, know everything there is to know about a PN junction uh, until we start using it in an electrical circuit, which we'll talk about next time. What we've learned, though, so far about just a static PN junction, uh, we, we've learned how to form one in a typical kind of way. Um, you should know what drift current is. 
What's the, what does diffusion current mean? What do these terms mean? Define depletion region or the space charge region. You should be able to interchangeably use those terms. Why does a PN junction form a depletion region? What's the physics going on? You should be able to explain that in, in uh, simple terms or with a simple diagram. Why does a PN junction have a built-in voltage? What's the mechanism for forming this built-in voltage? And then you should be able to calculate both the PN junction built-in voltage and the depletion width using the, the equations from the previous slide. Well, that's lecture six, where we've talked about this very important structure of the PN junction. Next time, we'll use that PN junction to form uh, a diode and a capacitor. See you then.